Ladies and gentlemen, this is UX and this is Songs of Six. Six S Y X. Review by the channel Sets and Tech. Deranged Jadison. Is there any other? Yeah, obviously this is a Seth video, so it's gonna be crazy. Judging from the thumbnail, feels like it might be those pixelated type of game. But it's a new one, 2020. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting. This is the type of video I wait from Seth to review, I guess. Yeah, I still remember Dwarf Fortress and Space Station 13, especially Space Station 13, because it's like very unique in its way, right? People create its own uh, like uh, servers and things, different type of things you can do. That is so insane of a game. I'm envisioning that like 3D version of that game. I don't even know how someone's going to implement that. Maybe it will take decent enough time before like technology and engine becomes strong enough to do all that. Even then, I don't know. But yeah, uh, so I don't, I don't know what type of game it's going to be, but I hope it's one of those type of game where... Uh, it's like pixelated uh, engines because of that you don't have to worry about a lot of like graphics and things so you can do a lot of things that's one thing i found out right factory and all that so yeah let's watch one remember if you like my don't forget to subscribe so that way i know we start with tomorrow uh check out the reaction there's a link in the season or in the end of the video end card yeah let's do it what is the worth of a human life i can't give you that answer but i can tell you the worth of an elvish life 62 meat and 17 lever once you really peel them down. Hey, hey, people. Organ simulator. Despite doing this for several years, I have never figured out how to use a microphone. And for this, I sincerely apologize. Songs of Six. They use, you're using Scarlet interface, which is like, yeah, it's good, but I use SS, SSL too. Apparently it's good. I realize that this doesn't have that much bugs in it. Six is an ambitiously made, self-styled city-state simulator, developed for the better part of seven years. Now, imagine, you start playing the game, and naturally, you play the tutorial. I imagine most people do. The difference, however, is that over a hundred hours later, I am still on the tutorial. This is the story of Jacketon, the default starting location for the tutorial, which is named after the developer. We have no mountains, no natural resources, a sprinkle of trees, a small lake, and generally like Factorio, nothing. Man. We're sandwiched between four neighbors, the city-states of Tegenval and Sluva, and the empires of Starless and Ulisu. In a word, it's not looking very good for us. In the beginning, you start with a couple dozen citizens and a dream of something greater. Unfortunately, we are Cretonians. These are peaceful, vegetarian pigmen with no aspirations beyond slumming in the dirt and farming crops. But for our purposes, they're perfect. And I quickly started an agricultural operation. It's uh, not much, but at least we're not starving. Grain has to be processed by a bakery, while fruit and vegetables can be eaten directly. Regrettably, instead of a fruit farm, I started an orchard. I did this on the promise that it's a slow operation with twice the potential yield. To this day, it has produced no fruit, because by the time the fruit trees mature... So let me get this straight. We are pig people or literally waiting to be slaughtered by our neighbors we are like you know making fruit now it's like it's like can you can you invite people more like come kill us that's what this is sure i get a worm infestation and have to chop them all down citizens typically prefer locals over immigrants and the only way to increase the local population is by having children at the local nursery in this game I a mean... year is 16 days and each four days is a season a baby becomes a child and a child becomes eligible for labor at four years of age songs of six encourages the miracle of childbirth with the economic miracle of child labor also after my pigmen accidentally snacked on all the vegetables in the nursery crib i can confidently confidently tell you infant mortality has no effect on the happiness of your population but you know what has an effect on my happiness getting paid to plaster my walls with illustrations of naked women hang on guys this wall it's so barren so dull so lifeless look i'm not gonna lie every time i think whenever seth plays a game he always thinks like can i do like all the taboo things i can think of that starts with anything like child labor and shit like that there you go he always goes for something like that because every video kind of starts that way. Luckily, today's sponsor is Displate. Displate is a unique metal poster designed to capture all your passions. Whether they be Elden Ring, Star Wars, Warhammer, or Call of Duty, Displate has over 2 million artworks across hundreds of brands. If you know me, you'll know I love my Displates more than any lame paper poster. But what if they could be even better? You see, I can only look at my normal posters. That's a problem. And the solution is Textra. Displate's brand new tactile poster collection. Now I can run my fingers along my press 
precious disc plates and really feel those tactile textures, 3D contours, and selective matte and gloss effects. And of course, it makes them look even cooler. The new texture finish will be available on hundreds of the best-selling disc plates, and disc plate looks forward to expanding the library of disc plate textures in the following months. So, what are you waiting for? Go to display.com forward slash Yeah, I will think of Fallout. Fallout posters would be the best. Fallout is the only universe that's like implemented from real world in a way that just like feels grounded. Even though it's crazy stupid, it's grounded somehow, which is fun. So Fallout posters would be awesome. Even with the you know TV show, which was also awesome. Yeah, I know, you know, I'm a fan of Goggins, obviously. You know, I've, I've watched him in many movies, Tarantino movies and like shows as well. But like an actor is an actor. So I don't know. I always felt like, hmm, this might suck. But it didn't, right? Some other show was good slash Seth and check out the selected designs that you can now get with a new Textra finish. Transform your walls today with Textra. And thank you to this plate for sponsoring this video. Your city lives and dies on happiness. If you fail to keep your citizens happy, you'll start a failure cascade that ends in ruin. The simulation goes down to each individual citizen and measures the average fulfillment of their needs and desires for that particular race. Race is an interesting topic. Some races don't get along. Some races are predisposed to crime. Some races control our educational sector, our labs, and our academia. But what else am I supposed to do when everyone else hates education? I'm talking, of course, about none other than humans. Humans are troublesome, criminal, and have a lowest sanity score of any race, which means an essential component of any healthy human population is an asylum. But they heckin' love science, which is important because this game handles research in a unique fashion. You don't just learn something. No, you research it, and then you have to pass on that generational knowledge across time. Remember, we don't start with paper. We get to that point after multiple generations of oral tradition. And even then, we have to maintain and preserve our existing knowledge against entropy. Almost every other race dislikes intellectualism and prefers to be indoctrinated. This is advantageous as it fosters loyalty in the absence of happiness. An open mind is an open bussy, its gates unbarred and unguarded. Some might argue that great men are made, not born. In the case of Dondorians, that is literally true, because they appear as fully formed adults at the base of a mountain. For this reason, the only way to get what? Dondorians is by immigration. They're good at mining, they're good at Minecraft, they're basically dwarves. The Tilapi are forest-dwelling elves. They're good with trees and they're good with nature. What else? They're also known for violating human men for several days before they cannibalize them. Bizarrely, this makes them compatible with a cave-dwelling Garfimi, who are effectively bug men. No way, that's the, that's real lore. Come on, man. Sometimes, like, sometimes sad jokes can feel... Is that a real lore? Somebody comment down, because that's insane. Because, oh, look at that. They're tree-loving. Oh, look at that. from Tolkien's and everything. Yeah, it makes sense. Elves, trees, nature. And then it just took a dark turn. Really dark turn. So dark turn, like, you know, like, even the most forums and Pornhub wouldn't touch that shit. So, <laughs> I hope that real, man, that, 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 that would be so good. But edgy shit. Games like this can do that. Men. What they lack in skill, they make up for with raw numbers. And there's nothing bugs enjoy more than plucking limbs from the other races. And while most cities will have a mixed population, some races don't get along with anyone. The Amevia are coastal dwelling lizard men. They're uniquely xenophobic and incompatible with other races, which is offset by their impressive physique and high lifespan. If you want a true monocultural isolationist experience, try the lizards. Finally, there are two giant races you can't normally get. The in-lore explanation is that their populations have been decimated over the course of several great wars. If you control a region containing a haven and satisfy their high demands, they can be convinced to join your cause. While they have many differences, they do share a common trait. They're fucking gigantic and make for the best shock troops in the entire game. There's a bit of an irony in a sense that uh, they're incredibly rare and almost extinct, and the best thing they're good at is getting even more extinct. The Argonash are spider leviathans with a voracious appetite. They don't care for anything except food, which may sound simple until you realize the logistical nightmare of providing four meals a day to every person on the map. The Cantors may ask for more up front, but they're easier to satisfy. Generally, once I arrested two people at the same time, but only had one courtroom. One of the two arrested thieves had no legal rep. I like how this game already has logistical nightmares in it, right? Like, okay, we're gonna have these people. Okay, how are you gonna accommodate them, right? So whenever games do that, it's always awesome, right? Oh, you have, you have this gigantic, you know, monster animal. Okay, you have to feed that every day, and then it's gonna be. Otherwise, it will basically try to kill you. 
representation. They considered this a complete breakdown of my legal system and left in disgust. But at the time, I knew none of this. I was a young blood desperate to turn a profit and expand my settlement. YouTubers are a prime example of making the most amount of money with the least amount of skill and intellect. In a fair society, these are the people who should be toiling in the coal mines and dying of black lung. Appropriately, I simulated this by importing Garfibi slaves and renaming them the to my favorite content creators. I invested so much into this coal mining operation only to find out I've spent several in-game years for a tar pit with 30% efficiency. It wasn't just unprofitable, but because of the size and scale, the cost of maintenance alone sent me into the red. On the other hand, I found out slavery is actually quite well received, as my citizens enjoy a slave population so long as it's not their own. My settlement grew, and unfortunately, crime had become an issue. Another day, another flashing. The people lived in fear. Arrests had to be made, but because I spread myself so thin, I didn't have the resources or manpower to enforce it. And so, the public indecency continued until I increased my coverage. And, after the prison started filling up, I am forced to make a difficult statement. Dundorians are sex pests. Of the five indecent exposers, all five have been dwarves. I have no further comment. At this point, I was earning capital by exporting furniture. This game doesn't have a fixed economy. Trade prices fluctuate and work on the rules of supply and demand. Basically, if you can make your own, that's strongly encouraged. If you have excess to sell off, that's good too, but over trading a commodity. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how Let's Play of this game would go on YouTube or something because everything Seth is saying already is like YouTube probably is already like panicking every time he speaks anything. Right, uh, <laughs> Seth basically like saying something and putting out that I'm just saying this for your attention. I'm not trying to say anything type of way. But even then, YouTube is like panicking a lot of time. So yeah, any you no, know, I'll think about that a lot. YouTube algorithm, how does that work, man? Really, like, especially the like detection and all that, right? Because the games are becoming so good graphically. Sometimes it feels like a real scene. But somehow, even if it's like brutal scene, YouTube doesn't do anything. Even the doesn't even pick up. Right, the system doesn't even pick up like this is problematic. But even though it looks really good, like real thing, so how do how does it know like, well, you know the AI whatever? How does it know that this is not real? This is video game. So that all every time I think about this, this is insane, and especially things like that. Somebody says something wrong, right? YouTube is just gonna try to come after that. But unless it's part of a video game or something, so it's not a script. I get it if like under review and if the review happens and somebody comes to that conclusion, it makes sense. But how does like system realize like this is not real and this is from the game? So I don't know. Things like this would be like you know pushing the limit. And so, you know, sometimes like YouTube does go crazy, right? And just like strikes down somebody has nothing to do with. Then they explain. And a lot of like YouTube doesn't you know like to admit their mistakes, so they're like, okay, we're gonna keep the strike. So shit like this is like really intense. Commodity can apply disproportionate pressure on the value, which is minimized by the number of trade partners. So, if you want money, you better diversify. But if you don't, poverty also has its advantages. If our treasury is empty and we're dead broke, guess what? Our diplomatic gifts mean a whole lot more, which is important because if our reputation drops to zero with any of the four factions bordering us, we're getting invaded. And with a current standing army of zero men, I don't fancy my chances. So I would intentionally dip my savings into the red, plead, cry, and defecate in front of my neighbors, and a pathetic display made me an unattractive target for assault. I would reputation farm into the multiple thousands so I could reliably forget about it for the next dozen years, while enjoying the benefits of almost zero taxation on all trade. This gave me a lot of time to- There you go, that's a survival thing right there. People should have known that during the Genghis Khan time, Europe and everybody. How to survive somebody attacking you. Just live a shitty life. There you go. Starve every day. That's better, isn't it? That's better than getting invaded. That's just better. Yeah, just have, a sh have no money, no resources, starve every day, famine. That's what you're supposed to do. Come on. Experiment and figure out what I'm doing. Firstly, I tried mining gemstone. Subsequently, I failed at mining gemstone. Instead, I used the natural fertility of Jacketon and turned it into an opium plantation. I still had a lot of Garfini yes, slaves do. left over and put them to work in fields of poppies and cotton. However, I got overly ambitious and my bugs got a little rowdy. There is no other situation where the following words can be said. The cotton pickers are having another uprising. Subsequently, we abolished the practice. Not on moral grounds, but because they robbed my throne and took just about everything. Happiness was at an all-time low among my Dundorians, so I tried producing alcohol and opened a tavern. Demand outstripped supply. Access was terrible and supplies were so low. Yeah, 
he just went to the stages of European colonization and everything. Just that fast. Oh, okay, I guess, fine, we're not doing this. ...that it just made them angrier. So, I tried satisfying food preference instead. Mushrooms, fish, complex proteins. Then, I restricted everyone to just eating bread, and they were happier. Additionally, I tried introducing fine dining in the form of restaurants, and almost lost the game to a public riot. Not only did I fail to meet supply, but each time I did so, a citizen would starve, spiraling into a vicious loop. Their desire for the McMenu was so strong that it overrode their survival instinct to eat street food preferring instead the embrace of death. This was not a plague of famine, it was a plague of choice. After the many lessons learned, alcohol is haram, cooking is forbidden, and our entire food pyramid is bread. Finally, I did make a breakthrough in citizen satisfaction. It turns out that when I select and look at a random peasant, they are not meant to be caked in shit. And only after building bathhouses 40 hours into the game did I make that connection. Around this time, I also realized, after reading the tooltip, the reason for my insane cost of maintenance. You see, buildings have walls. Walls increase isolation. I did not build any walls. Do I have to rebuild my entire city? Yes, I did. I rebuilt the whole thing. And I learned to love city planning. Building design is incredibly fun, and there's no greater satisfaction than having an elegantly designed lavatory for optimal shitting, pissing, and sharding. In the end, you take so much pride in what you've built. Am I coping? Yes, I absolutely. But after numerous trials and tribulations, I had a stable, diversified economy and a series of shacks resembling civilization. Also, I promoted a four-year-old to become nobility because it's funny. Nobles provide a variety of beneficial effects, and currently, they're a work in progress. Or, as the developer translated to me, they cannot betray you yet. Everything was calm and peaceful, until we found a Cretonian with his eyes scooped out. On the body was a note, signed Jake the Invincible, claiming that he's saving lives by returning them to his forgotten god. Our city had a serial killer. Another day, another victim found dead. Eye sockets empty. Every victim was a Cretonian, and this was. <laughs> I like how they're talking like something like Jack the Ripper type of thing, right? When you make your city more organized and close to like industrial revolution type of way, where everything jam packed in one place, too many population like just doing that thing. By the way, there's a serial killer out there. That's so good, right? It's like the emergence of something like this happening. Right? When you do something like this, something like this will emerge. Clearly, a racially targeted crime. Terror ruled the streets, and we had no leads. It wasn't until a passerby claimed to see a Cretonian woman fleeing the scene. This information didn't add up, but we tortured a confession out of them, and they pleaded guilty to all crimes. The serial <laughs> killings go. promptly stopped. There you go, that's what you should do. <laughs> Find the next guy, just grab him, like, I don't know, like hold him for a few days, not hours. It probably confess, right? As evidence has shown, like rigorous uh, investigation, people will basically admit to anything. There you go, you found your killer. Everything's fine. There you go. Jake the Invincible was identified to be a middle aged Cretonian woman predating on her own people. We sent the killer into the arena to be chopped into pieces for the spectacle of a crowd. We gave their body as much respect as it deserved. We pissed on it and dumped it into a mass grave. Serial killings are rare, and they're not often so straightforward. You might get the wrong guy and torture out a false confession, or the trail simply goes cold from lack of evidence. Eventually, beyond exports and fields of opium, I found the most lucrative source of cash. I would intentionally reduce my army down to zero to try and entice rebels to attack my city. The moment this happens, I hire mercenaries, crush the invaders, and sell off their loot for fat stacks. This sent me from... Ah, yes. That never... Mercenary. That never goes wrong, right? Carthage tells us that. Like, mercenaries are the one. Yeah, there you go. Borderline broke to half a million in the bag. Now, hiring mercenaries is incredibly expensive. Paying them is even more expensive, but they handle their own supplies and they're instantaneous. I used them to conquer a neutral region, and as I did, my brain expanded and my neurons started firing. Because suddenly, I can hire more. For each region under my control, I get access to five extra mercenary companies. So I hatched a plan. Take all my money, raise an army of mercenaries, and conquer Winsta, the weakest nation I could find nearby. With each city taken... Oh no, oh no, he's getting ideas. Basically, he's going through stages of how things worked. How kings became stronger and they realized, wait a minute, I could do this shit. That's what this is. 
Oh, look at that. We are organized. Look at that. We are town now. We are like a city sized thing. We have things underway. Oh, we have logistics are figured out. We are making money. By the way, I have money now. I can hire mercenaries. Well, look at that. I have an army. What should we do with that army? Fuck it. Let's invade the next country or something. There you go. My numbers increased, eventually laying siege to their capital. I sold everything to keep those mercenaries paid. I almost ran out of money. If that siege lasted a day longer than it did, I would have lost. But in the end, it was worth it because I reached the max limit of mercenary companies and I could now recruit enough men to overpower anyone. Problem is, they're asking for 750k up front with a daily fee of 100k. Soldiers of fortune have a steep asking price, but what what if the Golden Horde could pay for itself? I've been on the back foot of negotiations, pleading and groveling to my neighbors for mercy until now. Selling my spoils, I muster a short-lived but massive army, declare war, intercept their army, and immediately sue for peace, to which they have no option but to accept my favorable terms. The best part about shotgun diplomacy is you already know the answer each time. Because once they surrender, we do it again until we empty their entire treasury, unknowing- There you go, capitalism <laughs> conquer, I guess, I don't know. Capitalism king or something. Why are you doing this? All for the money, man. If you do this, do this, you get the maximum money. By the way, don't you want to like conquer and have like glory? What the fuck is that? I'm, I'm money, it's all about money, man. There you go. <laughs> they just paid for their own demise. The century of humiliation was over as Jacketon turned on their allies. No longer will I be extorted each time it's their nephew's birthday. Tegenval and Sluva were too small to resist. The elvish empire of Starless to the north was a different story, but led to the development of strategies I'd replicate going forward. Economic hyperwar is the act of manipulating the enemy to take decisions that are numerically beneficial while destroying them internally. We in invade cities, sell them back to the enemy, only to invade them again. Then, we use them as bartering chips for other cities, take control of those cities, demolish the walls, and advance our front line. We remove the need for extended siege and reduce the enemy to a single fight. There was only one exception to this. As luck would have it, the human empire of Ulisu to the south had the largest standing army in the world. Even if I recruited every mercenary, I would still be outnumbered two to one. So, I drained his treasury and I waited. Eventually, he could no longer afford to maintain his army and fell like the rest of them. Jacketon lives by a simple proverb, feed the earth and it will feed you. But we fed the earth so much that nature herself is vomiting up red. There's too many prisoners of war and not enough mass graves to go around. The rest is morbid history as I took the rest of the map. Jacketon is now the single state- Basically World War One in a nutshell. Everybody got their ideas of how they should get an upper hand. Everything went to shit. Great empire of the world. Resources are limitless. Currency is infinite. For we possess an infinite money printer. The design of which is as follows. I form a puppet state, declare war on them, take all their money from a peace treaty, invade them anyway, and install a new puppet to repeat the process. I have, in every sense, completely rigged the system. But like Sisyphus reaching the top of a mountain, I had nothing left to struggle against. And so too did I lose my interest. So I made a royal decree to arrest everyone. If you're ever interested in ending the game, just click prosecute on your main population. Go. Okay, he, he's went to the phase of like, after like gaining territories, gaining power, when thing doesn't, things doesn't go your way because eventually you will hit a wall, persecute everyone. There you go, he's, he's reached that phase now. Guards start arresting citizens, then they arrest other guards before being arrested themselves. Prison wardens get jailed and break out of their own prisons. Chaos and pandemonium rule the day as everyone turns on each other and eventually they turn on me. In summary, Songs of Six has a very expansive, detailed, and enjoyable tutorial. At 160 hours of playtime, I can't wait to play the actual game. This may not take the spot for game of the year, as we all know that's reserved for churn vector, but it's a very close second. The graphics, the changing of seasons, the the music, the scale of a simulation, considering this is written in Java, I have no words. There's no other game <laughs> where the line between city builder and sociopathy is so blurred. To demonstrate this, for my second playthrough as the Garfimi, I proposed a novel form of meat production. It's less of a ranch or a pasture, and more of a tilapi nursery. For reference, at a consumption rate of half an apple a day, a fully grown tilapi child costs us 32 apples, but gives us 
twice that amount in meat and lever. And once they're adults, we arrest, execute, and butcher them. The tilapia child to tilapia soup pipeline is highly effective. And while my humans don't agree with cannibalism because they're bigoted chuds that can't grasp the richness of Garfimi culture, their stomachs can't complain. So what have we learned today? One, prisoners are the ultimate cash crop. Labor is a resource and so are they. Two, look past people and their differences and see them instead as a source of protein. Three. The only thing we've learned is that people's imaginations have no ethics. Every time people like, let's imagine something, they go to like cannibalism, murder and all the fucked up shit. That's the one thing that I've seen is common. What should we think of? No, no, that's that. No, everything, everything has to go just like, that's why people love Fallout, right? Of all the game, why do they love Fallout? Because it's completely fucked up. Everything's fucked up. Hey, great game. Well, I can't complain. I like Fallout as well, but still. Much like real life, retirement is economically unfeasible and exists only as a carrot and stick to motivate the working class. I give this game my highest recommendation. I give it no days of food out of we're about to starve. And because it's mainly one guy and not a corporate entity, I can just ask for a sale. If you're interested, it's 20% off on GOG and Steam for the rest of April. The first hundred to use the link win a free chemical castration or prefrontal lobotomy. Terms and conditions may apply. As always, more content to come. So stay tuned a warm thanks to the many members of the merchants guild Je of course he's gonna use this i think it's funded. done right yep, it's done all right i like seth has gone back to like uh seeing some small developer game like that which is awesome and promoting them seth has a real effect right people's game sales go up really significantly if seth reviews i'm pretty sure that's gonna happen to uh this game as well but yeah uh so yeah game looks really awesome same as like the space uh, you know space station and like a dwarf fortress things like that factorio it's like real elements that goes in the background you can do a lot of things right people want an open world rpg game to have things like this with action consequences element of things but it's not that easy obviously games like baldur's gate 3 and everybody just says it okay it can be done but yeah but games like this is like really great you don't have to think about mechanics that much uh because it's not 3d you don't have to think about graphics you can only focus on you know gameplay mechanics and gameplay element which is great so all the things you can do in this game is insane and obviously Seth is going to go into the most evil path ever. He starts with like, oh, look at that. We can exploit this eh, at the four years of age. There you go. Go mining or whatever. There you go. But yeah. All right, well, that was Songs of Six review by channel uh, Sazen Tag. If you like my reaction, don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you next time.